Hi everyone, here are some things I just wanted to highlight about module two and specifically preparing for the assignment that is due with that. So I'm showing you the web page for the assignment itself. And I think it's helpful not only to look at the steps to complete the assignment, but also to open up the rubric where you can see how each of the different parts are evaluated. I realize some of these things you've already been working on, you're going to be revisiting them and revising them in relation to this assignment, but you can kind of see how the outline of the paper should take shape. So you'll be summarizing your problem of practice and explaining some context with that, and that summary will be informed by the other sections of this paper your analysis of some root causes that you want to focus on, uh, a chart that you are going to insert or a table, and I'll go into more detail about that in a minute, but let me know if you're concerned about that aspect at all. And then a comprehensive root cause analysis that you're going to do, followed by a plan, an idea for a plan to start to um, address these things that you're seeing, okay? There's also a section about APA formatting, just to be aware that that factors into the grade, and, um, and a section here in the rubric about your ability to, or your practice of using existing information to create uh, new context, new content. So that's about the development of what you already know and taking it a step further. All right. A few things that I found particularly helpful in your readings this week, and this actually all comes from Dr. Hinnon Crawford's book, The Improvement Science in Education Primer that you have. I liked that she puts the types of variation into just these two simple terms. I realize they're both related, obviously, and you might be looking at both of them, but what are you generally thinking about when you're writing and thinking this week? Are you considering the variation in process, the implementation, excuse me, the variation in the implementation of desired tasks or performances, or are you primarily focused with the variation in the desired outcomes at this point? And then she also breaks this down further. Are you thinking about procedures, practices, policies, priorities, or personnel? And personnel, of course, can have to do with not only who you need and in what amount of time, but also any concerns you have about how groups are working together. This could include factors concerning silos, um, when departments are working basically separately from each other, or ideas about communication and trust. And then also how big or complex are your systems that comes up in the reading. Now, on page 99, um, Dr. Hinnant Crawford relayed some information from a, com a personal conversation that she had had with a colleague, and you can find um, more about Darius Stanley online and his research. But this is, I raise this for a couple of reasons actually. One, this is how you would cite a personal communication. So a personal communication is anything from email communication to um, speaking with somebody to hearing somebody talk, but the point is, is that it's not findable by the reader. So if you look on page 99, you'll see that, how she has cited that in the context of her paragraph, and you also will not find a corresponding citation for Stanley in the back of the chapter reference list, and that's why. In any case, Stanley has an ecological model way of thinking about where equity work needs to take place. And this reminded me of a model that I examined when I was an EDD student that is often cited in student development theory for college students. So I put them side by side here. But essentially this talks about where improvement take, can take place in a system. So in Stanley's model, there's the interpersonal level, which is the classroom, the organizational level, which is the school or college, and the structural level, which is society. Bronfenbrenner uses the word system. So in Bronfenbrenner's model, there's the microsystem, which is what's called the home environment. Could be the, it would be the classroom in a school or university. And then there is the mesosystem. This is the larger community that links 
backwards and or upwards and downwards to the microsystem and the exosystem. So to me, a mesosystem in a university is a department, but it could also be a social area of campus, could be a, a club, for instance. And then we have exosystems. So exosystems are not places that can be physically stepped into. They are influences, supports, policies. If you've ever studied things like social capital or economic capital, um, cultural capital, that to me would fit into this realm of the exosystem. And then there's the macro system, which is paradigm, society, and culture, which to me relates to Stanley's structural area. So food for thought, there's different ways to think about the ecology of an organization and how it fits into the wider scope of things. And I wanted to draw your attention to that. Another thing that you can think about is tying the idea about actionable problems of practice into this ecosystem idea. So when you're thinking about actionable problems of practice um, in what areas of your organization or, or outside of your organization do people agree with you that this is a problem? In particular, is the problem urgent and is the problem feasible to tackle? And I bring those two ideas up because often that relates to the a question people often ask about change, which is how much is it going to cost? Okay, so another part of this module is to explore what are called run charts and Pareto charts, and there are synonyms that work for these. So if you've never heard run chart or Pareto chart, and, and I, re, I bring this up because they weren't discussed in those terms in my program, I wanted to just translate that information for you. So a run chart is um, a way of graphing instances of an event or the measure of an event along a time frame or a sequence. And this is very similar to a basic line chart that is organizes information um, across dates, for instance, dates in time. And that can help you to see change over time or a pattern over time, especially if you've done something that could affect what you're measuring like an employee professional development. Or maybe you're measuring an event in relation to something that has happened to the organization, such as a lot of people resigning at once or um, some other event that has caused disruption. Then a Pareto chart is showing comparisons among groups for a different variable, or excuse me, for a given variable or qualities of an occurrence. Really, they're just simply cross-tab analysis or simple group comparisons. Those are words that are used for that. And that can be done in simple tables or it can be done in bar charts. So um, run charts and Pareto charts go by different names, but I'm, I just raised that because I'm sure you've done them already in some form for your work, but maybe you've just, they've gone by a different name. I would like to show you this website by Tableau. Um, I once examined Tableau to see whether it would be an interesting piece of software for uh, EDD research. It's, it's really complicated and it's really more software than we need to do, that I've found to do EDD research, but I've always loved this web page that they provide and it explains what we use different types of graphics for. So I offer that to you as something you can use for reference because if you're using Excel, for instance, to um, make a pivot table or a chart, Excel these days, I mean, lots of software does this. It just um, gives you options without you having to really think about why you're using one or the other. And likely you're making the right choice and picking the one that visually represents your data. But it's maybe been a while since you thought about why we use particular charts to show different things. So there are links you can click on here to look into that in more detail. The last thing I want to talk to you about is how tables and figures look in papers. And you might be familiar with this to different degrees, but this is a helpful web page from APA from their style blog. It's in your manual as well. I was being a bit flexible with terms just now about charts and tables and graphs and so forth. But when we're formatting for instance, your dissertation or for publication, anything graphic you put in is either going to be a table or a figure. So this is a web page about that. Tables are generally used to communicate numerical information. 
you'll see that it starts with the word, or you can ignore that heading, it'll start with the word table in bold, and then the tables will be sequentially numbered, just like the figures will be, one, two, three, four, five, etc. The numbering is unique to the set of tables and the set of figures. And then you have the title in italis, italics with all the big words capitalized. And then if you examine this example and any others, you'll see that the lines that are used, they're used very sparingly. So you'll have a top line, horizontal, and you'll have a bottom line. But the only other lines you'll put in are, are just enough to help offset some of the column headings. And then you use spacing and font size and some centering of numbers to help it look visually appearing, appealing. The last thing to um, note is that you'll often have a note at the bottom of it. It's in italics with a period. And then you can, in simple plain language, discuss other aspects of your table that your reader needs to know to interpret it. The same goes for figures. Uh, so if you were to use a run chart, it would be called a figure. And I wanted to show you this example because actually whatever data you're using, you'll have to explain to me where you got that data, explain to your reader. And so that goes in the notes field. And you'll see that it's actually um, presented in a little different format than it would go in the list of uh, references at the end. You start with the title for one, and you capitalize all the big words, and then you use the word by and do first initial last name for the authors. Then comes the year and some of the publication information. And if you're citing material from your workplace, you can just find a way to naturally explain that. The last thing to note is that every table or figure needs to be what's called called out. If you want an example of that, you can go back to your Hinnant Crawford text and look at page 85. And at the very bottom of page 85, she has the sentence, as you see in chart 6.6, .6, and if you turn the page, that chart is next. There's actually a typo, it should have said 4.6, but the point is to show you the call out. So the call out can happen at the beginning of the sentence or, or at the end of the sentence. You can have the word figure one or table one in parentheses, or you can make it part of the sentence, but you call it out before you show it in your paper. So that's about all you need to know for now about that. And um, I'll help you correct anything that I see when you turn in your papers. So um, have fun this week with your research and discussion. Let me know if you have any questions about anything.